Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. So, I was always much more of a Lemony Snicket kid than a Harry Potter one. The series of unfortunate events books and the deadpan clever way that they played with language was hilarious to me back then. The books also had an edge of darkness to them which really stood out to me at the time, especially when they were on the library shelf next to these like bright, upbeat adventure stories. I love that the series didn't feel like it talked down to the readers at all. Characters died, the heroes almost always lost, and many of the good guys turn out to be completely clueless and unprepared. At the time, it felt like nothing else I had ever read. And even though I haven't gone back to them in a long time now, I do have really fond memories of buying like The Slippery Slope the day it released and just devouring the entire thing. So being 11 and a huge fan, I was basically the target for 2004's Series of Unfortunate Events movie. And now usually this is the part in these videos where I say that it came out and I was completely disappointed and that it failed to translate anything that made the book fun or special. But you know I really don't think that's the case here. I loved the movie when it came out, I watched it endlessly on DVD. And you know what, rewatching it now, I still kind of feel that way. It's not a perfect film, but I was kind of surprised by how much it blew away all of the Narnia, Aragon, and Percy Jackson movies that I've watched recently. I know Netflix has their own show that is a more faithful and less condensed adaptation of these books, but standing on its own, I think this movie largely works pretty well to the point where I wish they had been able to continue the story. Trying to adapt three books at once was probably its downfall, but it at least seems to like and understand the tone of these books in a way that many of these other adaptations just haven't. So that's what I wanted to highlight this week, why I think this movie is actually kind of underrated at this point. The only thing Jim Carrey loves more than a self-inflicted beating is his new movie Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. In before we get to the film itself though, I should probably talk about its actually very rocky development history. Nickelodeon purchased the film rights to the series less than a year after the first book, A Bad Beginning, was released. And right away, there was a push to get it off the ground. One of the big names rumored to direct early on was Terry Gilliam, the former Monty Python member who had directed movies like Brazil, Time Bandits, and Twelve Monkeys. It's really easy to see why he'd be on the list, since his movies have a unique art direction that probably seem pretty well suited for the novel strange style, which blends like a Victorian Gothic aesthetic with 1930s and 40s Americana. But like so many projects through the years that Gilliam was rumored to be working on, it just never happened. Writer Daniel Handler, the actual author of the Lemony Snicket books, was dead set on Guy Madden, a beloved Canadian art house director who had made My Winnipeg. Maybe not surprisingly though, Nickelodeon was not on board with giving the production to a director who had never been all that interested in box office driven studio filmmaking. Eventually, they decided on Barry Sonnenfeld, best known for Men in Black and the Addams Family films. It seemed like a very safe bet, but it actually wasn't long until he quit the film. Years later, he would pinpoint his main reason why, the overemphasis on Jim Carrey's counter bluff. The director felt that the character had overtaken the rest of the movie, taking the focus too far away from the Baudelaire orphans. But he liked the source material so much that he actually stayed in touch with Handler and eventually became a producer of the Netflix version. That left the films in the hands of Brad Sieberling, the director of 1995's Casper. On paper, that's probably not a good sign. And I do agree with Sonnenfeld that Jim Carrey kind of takes over this movie, but honestly I still think it works. I really do love the look of this film. Yeah, it has some CGI that doesn't really hold up, but I love the use of matte paintings and these massive, like really well designed sets. The movie may be outdone by the TV show in a lot of other ways, but one aspect I feel like it pulls off much better is the look. It's shot on 35mm film and I just think it looks a lot nicer than the overly bright, very fake digital feel that way too many kids movies and shows have today where everyone constantly looks like they're probably standing in front of a green screen. The production design is maybe the star of the show here, and sometimes that's okay. Then there's the cast, which even taking Jim Carrey out of the equation is pretty stacked. Jude Law, Meryl Streep, Catherine O'Hara, Louise Guzman, 
This cast is pretty far from something like Aragon, where it felt like Jeremy Irons was having to carry the movie on his back. Because there's plenty to enjoy here even when Carrie isn't mugging it up. I think the kids are really solid too. Emily Browning gives probably the best performance of the three as Violet. Liam Aiken is pretty good as Klaus, though I do feel like this movie is weirdly nervous to make him seem like too nerdy or something. Which is extra strange considering that's kind of the character's entire personality. I mean they don't even give him glasses in this, which may seem minor, but like the fourth book entirely revolves around that, so kind of a strange choice. Then there's Sonny, who is played by twin toddlers. And Sonny's scenes have probably aged the worst since they lean on that 2004 CG a bit too much to show us how much she loves biting. Overall though, I like this cast, I think they're likeable. I guess I have to talk about the elephant in the room though, Jim Carrey. He goes big here and gets to lean into his most over the top instincts. And it definitely changes the tone of the character a bit. Reading it as a kid, Count Olaf was scary to me. And that's never the case here where he's having a good time and turning the shtick up to 11. The thing is though, I don't hate it. I think Carrie is the most fun when he's in these ridiculous disguises. Count Olaf is an incredibly over the top character, so he has a lot of leeway to just go all out. I don't know how impartial I can even be here though because some of his line readings in this movie are just forever burned into my brain because they were so funny to me in middle school. I like this version of Olaf, even if it does cause characters like Uncle Monty and Aunt Josephine to kind of get the short end of the stick. Especially Monty. Billy Connolly is great casting, but he's just not in the movie enough. We get a very condensed, kind of cliff notes version of the reptile room, which left fans feeling a little cheated. I understand that, but the performances are so fun here that I think it kind of makes up for it. Meryl Streep is having a great time as Josephine, and the idea for this character that she's like a shut-in who's terrified constantly, yet also lives in this house that looks like it's about to tumble into the lake at any time, is still just a really good one. As shortened as those sections are, they still get across something that always felt really important to the series. This idea that adults can and will let you down, no matter how well-intentioned they are. I started reading these books when I was like 9 or so and that was kind of a powerfully scary idea. That even though Uncle Monty seemed like a smart, kind man who had all the answers, he wasn't really much more helpful to the Baudelaire's than Mr. Poe the idiot banker was. That gave the books a real sense of an ease for me back then and I think the movies do a great job of that too, even if the characters roles are reduced. The tone and deadpan humor of the books is very much intact, and I think it works alongside Carrie's very not deadpan performance surprisingly well. So while some fans might think of the movie as a terrible adaptation, I'm just not in that camp. I think it captures the spirit of the novels really well, if not the specifics and has the production design to really back it up. If I had one major problem with the film, it's that it kind of tries to tack on a happy ending where none can really exist. We're shown that Count Olaf is ordered by the courts to survive all of the things he forced the kids to do in like a quick Family Guy style cutaway, and it seems so tonally off from the rest of the movie. Like this may sound obvious, but the concept of death actually matters for most of the film's running time. Like characters are actually put into situations where they die. Like real characters that we care about die in the film. But this one little Olaf scene is like a Roadrunner cartoon where he's like being hit by a train and surviving. Now maybe that's too nitpicky, I don't know. It bothered me as a kid and it still did watching it this week. Overall though, I was surprised by how much I still liked this movie. No, it's not going to be the definitive adaptation. If you're interested in the larger mysteries of the VFD and the Sugar Bowl, or the actually pretty complex moral quandaries that Handler puts his characters into in later books, you won't find those here. But now that Netflix's version is out and this story has been told on screen in a more complete form, I'd hope that people are finally able to maybe look at what this film did right. A great cast, amazing set design, and a really moody score. There's a lot of things to like here, and I was glad to have a chance to revisit it. 
it was pretty refreshing to cover a YA adaptation I actually liked. And if you're in the mood for some more positive videos, you're in luck. On my streaming video service Nebula, I have two exclusive videos covering the title sequences of Cheers and Rick and Morty in the Working Title series. And I'm far from alone. H Bomber Guy has covered True Detective, Nando V Movies has covered One Punch Man, and way more. Nebula is a way for YouTubers to work outside of the constraints of the algorithm. And that service and Curiosity Stream come bundled together in a great deal. Curiosity Stream is where I just watched Napoleon's Legendary Spy, a great documentary about just how advanced Napoleon's espionage tactics really were, which was super entertaining. Combine that with Curiosity Stream's documentaries on science, nature, and tech, and you have an unbeatable offer. You can get all of this for $14.79. And that's not for a month, that's for an entire year. A 26% discount. So get the deal now by going to curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. That's curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.